and welcome back to Student of the Gun Radio. I am your host, Paul Markle, and with me in the studio today is Jared. Now, my coffee mug of the day is my Smith & Wesson coffee mug. That's right, everybody gets one. We want to welcome you back to this uh, new edition of Student of the Gun Radio. And we want to thank you guys out there for supporting us, all of our fans. You've done a fantastic job. Pat yourself on the back. Now, don't do it if you're driving, but if you're not driving, pat yourself on the back. Uh, this week, we uh, – we <laughs> Jared, did we jump the shark? That's right. For those of you who don't know it uh, – iTunes. Now you can listen to our show on lots of different ways. You can listen to it directly from Student of the Gun Radio, studentofthegun.com. But if you're using a mobile device, most people use either iTunes or Stitcher. And iTunes obviously rates their podcast radio shows. And we were up against the dive film shark videos. And you might be thinking, what? And that's what I was thinking. I was thinking, what? How is how is the HD shark podcast in the same category as Student of the Gun Radio? Well, it is. <laughs> and we were number two right behind the uh, the shark podcast. So what we did is we said, hey, you guys out there in the audience, help us jump the shark only in a good way. And guess what? We beat the shark. That's right. We beat the shark. As of yesterday morning, as I record this, uh, we were number one in the iTunes outdoor category. So, like I said, pat yourselves on the back, and we very much appreciate all the support we get from you guys out there. Now, who's our sponsors today? Well, obviously, our bandwidth sponsor is Firearms Radio Network, and we want to thank them for bringing us on the network and letting us be a part of it. We also want to thank our sponsors, Crossbreed Holsters of Republic, Missouri, and Keltec Weapons of Cocoa, Florida. Now, last week, we announced that we were going to be doing a Student of the Week contest. And uh, to be a Student of the Week, all you have to do is go to Student of the Gun on Facebook. Go to our Student of the Gun page. You need to like us. And then once you did that, you can go ahead and post comments. And we asked you guys, hey, if there's something you want to talk about or you want to hear about and you want me to discuss on the show, go ahead and post a Student of the Week comment. And we got a bunch of those this week, and we have picked a winner. Now, a lot of, <laughs> that's the tough thing about doing contests is, you know, lots of people write in, but there can only be one winner per week. And we have picked our winner. Hey, Jared, why don't you go ahead and tell us uh, who the Student of the Week is? Our student of the week is Lane Douglas. And Lane's question is, I hear of a lot of advice regarding owning a carbine that shoots the same caliber as my home defense pistol. What are your thoughts regarding this matching of calibers? Well, Lane, thanks for writing in. And that is an excellent question. A lot of people uh, have thought about that. or And I've actually been at live events, gun shows, and so forth where people have said, well, you know, if I'm going to use a carbine or I'm going to use a rifle to defend my home, I don't want to use uh, a 223 or 556 or something like that. I, I want to use a pistol caliber and uh, actually had one guy say, well, you know, uh, 223 is overkill for in and around your house. That's why I have a 40 caliber carbine uh, for my house. And what you need to understand is this, a pistol, a pistol cartridge, whether it's a nine millimeter, 45 ACP, 40, uh, 40 Smith and Wesson, what have you, it's still a pistol cartridge, even though you put it in a long gun. <laughs> it doesn't magically become a rifle cartridge or become more powerful because you inserted it into a carbine. Now, the the pro for having matching calibers is obviously you only have to buy one type of ammunition or one flavor of ammunition. Or when you're practicing, let's say you've got uh, uh, a kel Sub-2000 in 9mm and you also have a Glock 17 in 9mm. So you go out to practice with them, what do you have? Well, you only have to buy one kind of practice ammunition, so that is a plus, obviously. Uh, it, just from an economic standpoint, from a logistic standpoint, you're not buying all kinds of different ammunition. Also, uh, if you're going to use, if you want to save money when you're practicing, one of the things that we featured on Student of the Gun TV, and we featured it actually a couple of times, right, Jared, the CMMG, uh, CMMG uh, of Ms. Central Missouri Machine Gun, I think that's what it stands for. I think it actually really stands for Cougar, Cougar Maverick, Merlin, and Goose. We call those guys up. But uh, there's a Top Gun reference for you guys. 
But CMMG makes a 9mm carbine that is essentially the same as an M4. The controls are the same. Everything is the same except for the fact that it actually shoots a 9mm cartridge. Now, the, obviously, the big advantage there is 9mm ammunition is a lot cheaper than two two three or five five six. So if you want to practice with that, that's fantastic because you have the same operating techniques. Uh, you're operating the the nine millimeter carbine the same as you would a five five six. Only you're doing it for about half. You know, let's say where you're maybe paying twenty twenty two cents a shot for nine millimeter as opposed to fifty cents a shot or more for two two three. So there is a, a bargain there. There's a there's a savings. Now, what you need to understand, however, and there's the big however, is when it comes to stopping human being bad guys, bad guys that genuinely want to hurt you and hurt your family. And we talked about this before on a previous episode about level one, two, and three. And there are people that when you confront them with a gun, will be like, oh, there's a gun. I'm done. I'm out of here. There are those that won't stop until they're physically injured in some way. And then there's the level three that will not stop until they receive enough physiological damage that they can no longer keep going. And the reason we use rifles is because rifles create that physiological damage that makes bad people stop doing bad things. If you're going to buy a carbine, if you're going to buy a 9mm, 45, whatever, a handgun caliber carbine, if you're going to buy it because, A, it's compatible with your pistol and you want to save money on you only want to have to buy one type of ammunition, Okay, fantastic. Also, if you're using a long gun, a long gun is inherently more accurate because it is easier to shoot. Now you say, well, what do you mean? I'm not going to split hairs but that, but you have more points of contact with a rifle than you do with a pistol. And a pistol uh, is more difficult to shoot or a rifle is easier to shoot with than a handgun is. If you're putting it in the hands of let's say your wife, your kids, what have you, it's obviously easier for kids and your wife and people who don't shoot as much to get hits accurately on target with a long gun than it is with a handgun. So that's a that's a plus. Also, and I've mentioned this previously, and it's something a lot of people really kind of discount or they don't think about, is when there is a natural emergency, a natural disaster, a crisis, some type of a crisis where the police are stretched thin and you're pretty much on your own to defend your home and hearth, a long gun is always a better choice, even if it is a pistol caliber, because bad people respect long guns. You're like, well, what do you mean they respect long guns? Well, I was uh, I went down to New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, and I was part of a contingency of law enforcement officers from across the nation. We got down there. Uh, I arrived the the Sunday after the levee broke, so within a couple of days, a few days after the levee broke, uh, I was in New Orleans, and it was it was uh, Beirut Wild West time. Uh, it was it was pretty pretty bad. And uh, <laughs> after I got back from there, I found out that the media had been downplaying all the violence because they wanted people to keep donating money to the Hurricane Katrina Relief Fund. And they weren't going to donate money if they thought, well, these people down here are just like bad people. And they're shooting each other and they're robbing each other. I'm not going to send them my money. So they, they downplayed it. But here's the truth. The truth of the matter is, is bad guys. People that are bad guys and they've been bad guys their whole lives, they see police officers wearing handguns every single day, and it doesn't bother them one bit. That's just part of doing business. They see a cop with a pistol on his belt, eh, whatever. They see a cop with an M4 rifle in his hand come in their direction, they, they pause and think, hmm, this guy's probably going to shoot me, and I should probably stop acting bad right now. I should probably go another direction because when people have rifles in their hands, it's serious time. We're not playing around anymore. It's serious time. And uh, for all of the gun phobic, hoplophobic, anti-gun people, let me tell you this. If you have friends that are like this, do you know how New Orleans uh, was corralled, how it became safe again for the you know, the electric companies and the phone companies and for all those people to come into New Orleans and, and do the repair work, it was secured by men with rifles. 
men with rifles secured New Orleans so that the electric company and the phone company and the emergency relief workers, so they could come in and safely do their business. So when it's time to be do things for real, you want to use a long gun. And if you're preparing for a hurricane or, a, you know, natural disaster or whatever, and you want to have a pistol caliber carbine, you're going to look more convincing with a pistol caliber carbine in your hand than you will with a little handgun. That's just the way it is. So I, I, I don't know if that answers your question, Lane. I hope it did. If you're looking for economy, a pistol caliber carbine is fantastic. If you're looking for power... If you, you know, we use rifles as power tools when it comes to personal defense. Think of it like that. You know, think of your rifle not as a precision tool, but as a power tool. And uh, if you want, really want to make bad guys stop doing bad things, we use long guns. All right, next up, I know you guys want to talk about this because it's been in the gun-type news all week long. If you've missed it, shame on you, but don't worry, I'll bring you up to speed. Connecticut, the state of Connecticut. I believe, what does Connecticut call themselves, Jared? The Constitution State, which is just the craziest form of irony right there. Uh, Connecticut, which was already rated as the uh, uh, the Brady campaign, the people who don't think you are responsible enough to have guns, but the Secret Service is. The Brady campaign had rated Connecticut, I think it was number five, number one being the best as far as gun control laws in America. So think about it like this. If the Brady campaign rates your state high around number one, number two, number three, you live in occupied America. Uh, if they rate your state a number 50, I want to find out who 50 is, Jared. We should look that up. Find out the Brady campaign's number 50, and that's the state we want to live in. I have to believe that Mississippi's got to be pretty low on their uh, the Brady campaign uh, on their pecking order. But uh, Connecticut was already number five, which means in their minds, they had some of the best gun control laws in America. Well, that wasn't good enough for Connecticut. They needed to do more. They tried to out New York, New York, and it looks like they've done it. What Connecticut has done is with and and they they took the uh, the <laughs> they took the New York playbook where they decided that this was so important that we have to do something. It's so important that we do something that we're going to do it under cover of darkness. That's right. We're going to do it under cover of darkness, and we're just going to go ahead and pass this legislation uh, within 24, it was like 24, 48 hours. From the time it was introduced to the time the governor signed it, I believe, was less than two days. When in the history of the United States of America has any elected body ever done something that quickly? Well, the only uh, I know when I, I, when they want to pass themselves a pay raise, when uh, Congress decides that they need a pay raise, when do they vote on it? They vote on it at uh, 11 p.m. on a Friday so that you peasants won't know or hear about it. That's uh, that's when if the Congress is working at night, you can almost be assured that they're not working in your best interest. So what did Connecticut do? Well, Connecticut, they already had. An evil assault weapons ban. They already had an evil assault weapons ban on the books. Well, they expanded the evil assault weapons ban. Oh, Jared just showed me he's got the Brady campaign map of states with the worst gun control laws. And uh, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, Florida, those are all on the on the Brady campaign's Worst gun control laws. Now, California, New York, Connecticut, and Massachusetts, they're all at the top. So you should, you guys need to be proud of yourselves. Congratulations. So <laughs> Connecticut, they expanded the assault weapons ban. So it's not, now you say assault weapons, your, your grandma thinks assault weapons are machine guns, doesn't she? Yeah. Uh, your, your, your uh, great uncle Fred thinks assault weapons are machine guns. They don't know that they're just semi-automatic rifles that are made to look scary. If you make it look scary, and uh, Connecticut added their cosmetic features or additions. So if it has a pistol grip, because we know pistol grips make guns more dangerous, or a bayonet lug. Because apparently in Connecticut, there have been uh, a lot of rampant bayonettings. So we, we can't have those. Uh, <laughs> it, and if you're listening to this, you're probably shaking your head and you're thinking, are these people crazy? No, no, they're good liberals. They need to do something. 
You got to do something. Yeah, but what you're doing doesn't make any sense. Well, yeah, but it's something. But what you're doing isn't going to stop crime. Well, but we have to do something, says the six-year-old. We have the equivalent of a bunch of mental six-year-olds in uh, the state houses and the, the national house right now. It's it's ridiculous. Uh, what we've got uh, is people that are just going to do something. Well, Connecticut, here's the biggest thing that you guys need to worry about or that you need to be concerned about. Uh, well, number one, uh, they, they outlawed all magazines, and un- unlike... Uh, New York that did, I believe New York's was like a six month, uh, Connecticut, 30 days, within 30 days of the signing of the bill, uh, any magazine that holds more than 10 rounds is now a prohibited item. Uh, all these evil assault weapons, these guns that look scary, uh, any gun that looks scary is now an assault weapon and it's prohibited. And Connecticut went full retard in that you actually have to register your 30 round magazines. If you possess a magazine that can hold more than 10 cartridges. I know that the libtards like to use, say it holds more than 10 bullets. Uh, We'll just give them that one. Uh, They're actually cartridges of ammunition for you ignorant people. But if it holds more than 10 cartridges, you have to register it. And if it's not registered by the said date, you become a class D felon. That's right. Welcome to America where you woke up a citizen and went to bed a class D felon. Isn't that great? And you say to yourself, you're like, well, but how does this, all this stuff prevent crime? How does it stop criminals? Well, it doesn't. But what it does is it turns citizens into criminals. So you've got that. So now we have, instead of fewer criminals, uh, according to the new Connecticut state law, we potentially have tens of thousands of more criminals. But criminals that were once citizens. Now, how about actual recidivist criminals? Criminals that spend their entire lives breaking the law. Is this going to affect them? You mean the guy that sells uh, crack cocaine? or uh, manufactures methamphetamines, that guy is now going to be defenseless because he's no longer going to be able to possess bad guns. No, he's still going to have bad guns. The crack cocaine dealer is still going to have a gun. The people that traffic in in heroin and illegal drugs, they're still going to have guns. Well, how about rapists and murderers and so forth? Will they still have them? Well, I don't know. Is Is murder illegal in Connecticut? It is? What? It can't possibly be because if murder was illegal, there would not be murder. That's how we stop crime is by passing more laws, right? Uh, Nowhere in this new bill does it say that murder is double illegal or extra illegal or rape is extra illegal. How about theft? No, no. No, all the all the basic stuff like, you know, rape and murder and theft and robbery. Well, we know those are illegal and we know people are still going to do them. So what we need to do is we need to take the lawful tools that citizens have and we need to make those illegal. That That's good, good thinking. Now, one of the big things that Connecticut just did and they did uh, like New York did and, and Colorado as well is they essentially just, they looked at the Bill of Rights and I think they passed it around the room and they all wiped their butts with it. They don't know what the Bill of Rights is. They don't care what the Bill of Rights is because in their minds, they need to do something, even if it takes a big giant dump right on the Constitution of the United States of America. Uh, We know about the Second Amendment. We know that they, uh, in Congress, they don't understand the words shall not infringe. You guys, uh, go ahead and look up the word infringe. You go ahead and Google it on the Webster's Dictionary and see what infringe means. Uh, It means to impede or inhibit. Uh, (laughs) And I believe that this impedes and inhibits. But what about the Fourth Amendment? What about the Fourth Amendment that says you can be secure in your person's property and papers and that they cannot be removed or taken from you without a warrant issued with probable cause? How about the Fifth Amendment that says there's this little thing called due process? What does that mean? Well, it means you cannot be deprived of your lawfully owned property or of your freedom without due process of law. They can't just come and take it away from you and say, oh, you can't have that anymore because we don't think you should. Well, in the state of Connecticut, the Constitution state, uh, 
they've decided that your lawfully owned property is no longer your lawfully owned property. Well, what do you mean, Paul? That I still own it. It's mine. Ha ha ha. If you have to ask permission of the government to transfer your lawfully owned property from yourself to another person, is it still yours? Because the bureaucrat on the other end of the phone has the option to say no. And in Connecticut now, if you own a, let's say, I, I, I love the Benelli shotgun example, but you, you've got a Benelli, you've got a Super Black Eagle 2, which is an awesome shotgun. If you've never used a Super Black Eagle 2, it is the fashizzle of shotguns. Is it not, Jared? He's, he's nodding because he shot one. Uh, so you've got a Benelli Super Black Eagle, and you decide you want to upgrade. I want to get another one. And you're going to sell it to your buddy. Your buddy covets your Benelli shotgun. He loves it. He's like, dude, you've got to sell me that gun. Uh, I'll give you $1,000 for it. If he gives you $1,000 for your Super Black Eagle and you give him the gun in Connecticut, just like in Colorado, you're now a felon. What? Oh, yeah. You have to take yourself and your buddy into your local gun shop, and you have to request that your gun shop, aha, and the gun shop to do what? To conduct a background check on your friend. And it, they're, of course, they're going to charge you for this. It's not going to be free. You're going to have to pay for it. So now you have another tax on gun ownership or gun transfer. So essentially, every time one firearm transfers from person A to person B, a new tax has to be paid on that transfer. Thank you very much. And uh, they get on the phone and they make that magical phone call to some bureaucrat in some office somewhere. And the bureaucrat can say yes, no, or wait. We talked about this before. But if it's not, if you have to request permission to transfer your lawfully owned property, is it still your property? Or have your fourth and fifth amendments just been crapped upon? Ask yourself that, Mr. and Mrs. America. Right now, New York, Connecticut, and Colorado, and Brothers and sisters in Massachusetts and New Jersey and Maryland, you're next. You're next. Uh, obviously, the state houses and governments don't really care about what you have to say. When you've got a state house and a Senate and a governor that conduct legislation in secret, I, I believe it was 2 a.m. when they passed this. Remember what we said? The only time that they work at, at night under cover of darkness is when they're working against, against your best interests. And uh, how does the Connecticut bill make you safer? How does it make you safer? Bad people are going to all of a sudden start obeying the law. Potential murderers. If you're going to commit a murder, okay, you're sitting out there and you're thinking, hmm, I'm going to commit a murder. But I can't use a gun. You know what? I'm just not going to commit a murder. Or if I use a gun to commit a murder, that'll make me extra bad. Uh, what is the worst, most heinous crime that one human can commit against another human? Uh, is it not murder? So if you're willing to commit the most heinous crime possible, murder, you're concerned about breaking a gun law? Well, I was going to go in and rob that bank, but there's a shiny sign on the door that says no guns allowed and doggone it, I better find a bank that doesn't have one of those signs on it because I can't I can't violate the gun law by robbing the bank with a gun. Maybe maybe they'll rob it with a crossbow. Uh, I don't know. I don't think there's – well, the first time that happens, we're going to have a crossbow ban. So Connecticut, uh, the name of the story is Connecticut says to uh, Connecticut gun owners, you don't own that. It's not yours. Moving on, I'm going to have to just start a new – Jared, I'm going to have to start a new segment of the show called The New York Report because I swear to you, folks, I don't want to talk about New York every week. But between show A and show B and show C, every single week, New York does something even stupider. New York is now occupied America. If you live in New York State and you are a lawful citizen and you possess firearms, know this, you are under siege. There's no, there's no way around it. You are now a second class citizen because you own a gun and the, the state doesn't think you should. And they're going to do whatever they can to harass gun owners to the point where they just voluntarily surrender their guns. The next story comes out of New York. 
Uh, our source for that is theblaze.com. Thank you very much, Glenn Beck and his staff. It says, New York dad's pistol license suspended over something his 10-year-old son said, and he could lose his license for uh, up to eight years. Now, essentially, uh, the, what happened was guy gets up, sends his little little Johnny off to school. Little Johnny goes to school, and uh, he's 10 years old. How What is a 10-year-old? Like third grade, fourth grade, something like that? Around fourth grade. You guys remember when you were in fourth grade? Uh, I barely do. But uh, a fourth grader, 10-year-old, and they get into an altercation out on the playground. You know, kid A, B, C, and they get into a little tussle, whatever, shoving match or, you know, my dad can beat up your dad or whatever. Well, a teacher overhears a couple of the kids say the word paintball gun or BB gun or water gun and or squirt gun, something like that. So she freaks and calls the police, tells them there's kids are talking about guns. They're, they're, they're ready to go. They're going to, they're going to do something bad. So, Oh, what do we do? Well, we, we send the SWAT team out, you know, to find out what happened. Well, they, they find out that, that one little Johnny here, well, they find out who little Johnny's dad was. Well, little Johnny's dad has a pistol license. What? Little Johnny's dad owns guns. Well, we can't have that. So they contact little Johnny's dad and they're like, uh, do you, you know, blah, blah, our records indicate you're a handgun owner and you have a pistol license. And they tell him that uh, you're based upon the, uh, the accusation of the teacher of what she says she heard. They suspend little Johnny for two days. You think it's going to be over with? Oh, no. They're going to come and take uh, the man, this man, the father. They're going to come take his guns. They want to know how many guns he has, where they are, what they are. What? I'm sorry. And did I wake up a felon today? So uh, he contacts his attorney, and this man takes his he takes his guns to and he uh, takes him to a gun dealer so they can secure him, secure the guns. Well, the state suspended this man's pistol license. Well, first, go ahead, let's go ahead and dissect that real quick. For all of you reasonable people out there, all of you reasonable people that live in these states, we've already talked about this, but we're going to talk about it again, that make you, you know, secure a permit, special permission from the government to own a handgun, a rifle, whatever. But most of the time it's, it's pistol permits because what? That's just reasonable. That's reasonable. It's, I, I, I can see that. You know, you sit around having coffee, you know, with your uh, Aunt Susie, and she's like, well, that's, that's just reasonable. People should have to get permits to own handguns. Why? Why should you have to get a permit to own a handgun? Where in the Constitution of the United States does it say that the citizen shall seek out permission from the government before arming himself? I've read the Constitution a couple of times. I didn't see it in there, but apparent, but I'm not from New York. So maybe in New York, they read things a little bit differently. But in New York, all, all you, uh, you frogs in New York, they've been boiling you real slow for a while and they turned up the heat. So you guys that tell me that they're, you're out there and they're like, well, just because I got a license doesn't mean that's registration. And just as, because it's registered doesn't mean they're going to confiscate it. Go to New York and ask this dad how that works out. He's a registered gun owner. And because he's a registered gun owner, when his 10-year-old kid gets in trouble, what do they do? They run his name, find out he owns guns. Guess what? They suspended his pistol permit because of what he did? No. I read the, the statute in New York says you have to be of high moral character, cannot be a convicted felon, blah, 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 in order to possess a pistol permit. Well, this man didn't do any of that stuff. And yet here he is losing his right, his constitutional right, to own a handgun because the state has decided they're going to suspend it. And this 10-year-old child has just now, because he said the word gun in the presence of a teacher, has now become a de facto felon for life, I guess. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I understand that there are, you guys know that in the United States of America, a child cannot commit a crime. You're like, what? No, a child cannot commit a crime in the United States of America. Unless the child has found to, uh, can be tried as an adult, 
And the courts go through a, a very specific process to try a child as adult. An adult, they can either be an unruly child or a delinquent child but based upon X. You know, a child is a thief or a robber or steals from people, and he is found to be a delinquent child by reason of robbery, theft, what have you, or an unruly child because they, you know, they run away from home, blah, blah, blah. They disobey their parents. When children are adjudicated by the juvenile courts to be either unruly or delinquent children, they have remediation and so forth. Now, does it say in the story that this 10-year-old child has been found to be a delinquent child, has been ruled as a delinquent child by the juvenile court system? Because that takes a while. That You don't just do that like in a day. No. He was suspended for school for two days for saying the word gun. Uh, because, you know, in America at a public school, if you say the word gun, you are a de facto criminal. So uh, where's this guy's due process? Where's the due process here? Where and Oh, and also in a due process, you have the right to face your accusers and have an attorney present. Well, oh, we're just going to throw that due process stuff in the garbage can because – when you, when you throw due process in there, what that does is that slows down our ability to disarm the citizen, and we really don't like that, so we're just going to disregard it. We've decided that uh, due process is it's an antiquated thing, and when it comes to guns, we just have to do something, and we, we don't need to follow the, uh, the Bill of Rights or anything like that. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this dad's guns away from him, and he can't have his pistol permit back until his son turns 18 and moves out of his house because this 10-year-old is now apparently marked for life for saying the word gun in front of a public school teacher. People in New York, you if you're a gun owner, if you are a lawful citizen, you've just become a second-class citizen, and they're coming for you. And I hope I don't have to talk about New York again next week. I really don't. All right, moving on. <laughs> this is a fun one. Um I didn't know about this woman, but now I do. And I think a lot of you probably do. But if you don't, there is a representative called, her name is Diana DeGitt. I believe it's DeGitt or DeJet or let's just say DeGitt. And uh, you probably know about Diana DeGitt because Diana DeGitt thinks that, what does she call it? Magazine clips, ammunition magazine clips are bullets. And uh, she made a statement in a public forum. She was explaining to people why it's okay. Now, she's a, a U.S. representative. She's not just a, a state rep. Uh, she actually sits in the – she goes to Washington and votes on bills. Well, Diana DeGette is uh, one of the people that is sponsoring – the assault we- the new version of the assault weapons ban, and she specifically wants to get rid of these high capacity magazine ammunition clips because no one needs them. And she said it's okay because what you can do after you after they shoot them up, then they're gone because high capacity magazine ammunition clips are ammunition, and the bullets will be gone. Yeah, she's that bright. She's that smart. She's voting. Uh, against something that she absolutely has absolutely no idea how it functions. But do really we really need to know what we're talking about in Congress, or do we just need to feel the right way? I think we just need to feel the right way. Well, that was the first thing. That was the f- and and uh, it's been all over. It's been on the news. It's been on the major news channel. I think Fox talked about it. And because of that. I discovered this next clip. Now, this next clip was actually, it's a cell phone video, and it was in a public forum, and a a senior citizen gets up, and he starts asking her a question. And the audio is kind of bad from the senior because he's speaking forward, and the person with the cell phone uh, is behind him. And I'm sure that this cell phone video was never supposed to get out. But thanks to the magic of the Internet, it did. And I'll set the clip up for you real quick. Okay, a gentleman gets up. He's in a public forum. Uh, Diana DeGette, double D, for a double dose of stupid. And we're going to find out why. He asks her, he, see, he tells her basically that he's concerned with his own safety because he says, I'm at home by myself. And, you know, more than one bad person breaks into my home. What you're telling me is I should have to reload my handgun or whatever more than once he goes that puts me at a distinct disadvantage and uh what diana de says to him is really illustrative and we're going to listen to that clip right now my question is what about me mm-hmm. representative 
Senate again makes the point that this possible he was changing medicine. Name could have to be Walter. May not be one bad guy that comes in the house. I have magazine limited in safety. I have to change magazines. I am at a serious disadvantage. The question is, Representative, yet, what about me? Good news for you. You live in Denver. The DPD would be there within minutes. <laughs> you probably be dead anyway. So we'll, we'll do here in the car. purple sweater. All right. So you guys, you've got the audio. First, she tells him, and what we're going to do for you guys is, is uh, Jared, when we do the show notes for this this, this week, uh, this week's episode, we're going to put the direct link to the YouTube in there because you folks, it's good for you to hear it, but you need to see it because when you see it, you're going to see just the smug look of, of s- disgust on this woman's face. It's just the, she looks at him like, you peasant, how dare you peasants question me? She, she, and she has this smarmy, dismissive look. Think about it like this. Your, your uh, favorite, your great uncle Jack or your grandfather is up there asking this civil servant. Let's remember that when you're elected to Congress, you're a civil servant. You don't become part of an elite ruling class, but they've already decided that they are a part of an elite ruling class. And you peasants really need to just shut up and do what we tell you to. Well, first she tells him, well, the good news is you live in Denver and DPD will be there in minutes. All right, Sparky, I got one for you. Walk into your house, open your door and count. See how long it takes you to walk from your front door to your bedroom. 100 bucks says it takes less than 30 seconds. And that's walking. So home invasion. Two uh, tweaked out crackheads smash your front door in. Bam, smash. You wake up. Oh, crap. There's bad people in my house. Boom, boom, boom. They're at your bedroom door. Don't worry. The DPD will be here in four and a half minutes. How many bad things, how much damage can uh, bad people do in four and a half minutes? A lot. So, uh, yeah, her, her solution is, you A, peasant, you don't need to be defending yourself because the DPD will be there in minutes. And then she says to him, you'll probably be dead anyway. Yes, a U.S. representative, when addressing a senior citizen who is concerned about his own safety and the safety of himself in his home, says to him, well, you'll probably be dead anyway. Now, uh, I've been following the story pretty closely, and I haven't seen that the people of Denver and Colorado have recalled Representative Diana DeGette yet for making that statement. If that was my grandfather... I'd be pretty angry. I'd be I'd be pretty darn upset. It's not my grandfather, and I'm I'm still pretty upset. But uh, yeah, her statement is, "You'll probably be dead anyway." Oh, so that's what the citizens, the peasants, are supposed to do. The peasants are supposed to call the police and then just prepare to die. That's our solution now. It's okay if I disarm you by legislation, peasant, because we have police and they have guns, and it's no big deal because they'll probably come and find your body anyway. So uh, don't sweat it. It's disgusting. And if you live in Denver and you voted for this cretin, shame on you. And if you didn't, if you live in Denver and you didn't, have you uh, ordered her recall yet? Have you started the impeachment process yet? Really? No? Well, you should. And if you haven't, shame on you, too. But I know. Well, and, you know, the other thing is this good thing is you live in Denver and DPD will be there in minutes. So what you're telling me is that. Denver is a very safe city to live in, and it has a very, very low crime rate because DPD will be there in minutes. Is that correct? <laughs> All right. Don't, don't forget, folks, we want you to go to uh, go to the show notes and watch that. Share it with your friends. Do not let this, this arrogant person, this arrogant person who's decided they are part of the ruling class, she's about as, as intelligent as a bag of hair. Uh, and she's part of this elite ruling class who thinks that uh, we're just going to go ahead and disarm you peasants because you peasants aren't smart enough or mature enough or responsible enough to possess these mean, nasty, evil guns. 
Uh, all right. So what do you want to do now? Now, folks, we want to make sure don't forget about the student of the week uh, contest. Now, Mr. Uh, Lane Douglas, I believe it's a mister because Lane seems to be to be a man's name. If it's not, hey, I apologize. But uh, Lane just won himself an official student of the gun T-shirt. And you can, too. Just like us on Facebook. Go there and post your question. and We might use your question next week. And if we do, we'll send you an official student of the gun T-shirt. Now, what about official student of the gun gear? Well, obviously, you can get it by going to studentofthegun.com. That's right. We have DVDs. Yours truly, Paul Markle, wrote a book called Student of the Gun, a Beginner Once a student for life, and you really should be a student for life. If you're serious about it, don't decide that you have enough knowledge. Crave knowledge. Seek knowledge. Always be looking for more knowledge. That way you don't have to end up like a double D with a, a double dose of stupid there up in Colorado. Uh, I think Diana needs to read my book. She needs to read something. Uh, also, we have an Armed Living DVD. Oh, that's one other question. Jared, he just waved at me. He said, we had another question uh, that we, we didn't pick, but it was specifically about uh, concealed carry. And a, gentleman, a couple of people actually wrote in. They had concealed carry questions. And the, quite frankly, the questions were a little bit too detailed for us to, to discuss here uh, in, the, in the short form of the radio show. It was about, you know, my responsibilities as a concealed carry permit holder. Uh, what should I, if I ever have to use my gun? When is it lawful to use my gun? You know, when am I justified in using my gun? Now, we did a, a DVD called Armed Living, Concealed Carry in an Uncertain World. And in that DVD, we addressed a lot of those issues, and we did it deliberately so that uh, we wouldn't have to, you know, address those, address those questions one at a time. So, if you have questions about it, the armed living talks not just about how to shoot or when to shoot; it's how to shoot when to shoot, and then what now. And very few people will, you know, everybody likes to talk about how to shoot because that's fun. That's the fun part. And then some people will talk about, well, when can I shoot? And unfortunately, almost nobody talks about what now. And the what now is a pretty darn important part because the what now takes a long time. Depend, you know, after you do the shooting, what you do next can decide, determine whether or not you go to prison or whether or not you go back to uh, live with your family. So that's uh, Armed Living, uh, Concealed Carry in an Uncertain World. That's a DVD, and you can order that from studentofthegun.com. Now, we want to make sure we take a second here before we close to thank our good friends at Keltec Weapons of Cocoa, Florida. You want to check them out at keltecweapons.com. And, of course, Crossbreed Holsters of Republic, Missouri. And it's really simple is crossbreedholsters.com and our good friends of course at the firearms radio network until next time keep shooting straight and keep shooting safe